section one of a book of fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b a book of fairy tales by sabine baring gould preface the fairy tales in this little book are with two exceptions only those which delighted our fathers and grandfathers in their childhood in the form in which we have them they are not older than the end of the seventeenth century the majority of them were written by charles perrault whose collection of fairy tales appeared in sixteen ninety seven dedicated to one of the royal family of france it contained bluebeard the sleeping beauty puss in boots riquet and his tuft hop o my thumb little red riding hood cinderella the wishes etc to each of these tales was added a moral in bad verse the morals have been forgotten the tales are immortal but although written by perrault he did not invent the stories they were folk tales which he wrote in simple words as they had been told him in his childhood or as he had seen them in earlier collections the tales of perrault says dunlap are the best of the sort that have been given to the world they are chiefly distinguished for their simplicity for the naive and familiar style in which they are written and an appearance of implicit belief on the part of the relator which perhaps gives us additional pleasure from our knowledge of the powerful attainments of the author and his advanced age at the period of their composition the success attained by perrault's little collection animated others to write fairy tales such were the countess d'aulnoy madame murat and mademoiselle de la force but only the first of those approached perrault in charm of style and gained a lasting hold on posterity she told the imperishable tales of the fair maid with golden locks gracieuse and Percinet, and the white cat among a host of imitators none wrote stories that have lived except madame de beaumont who published her collection in seventeen forty and in it is beauty and the beast a tale that has gone through successive stages of simplification till it has assumed a form tolerable to childish minds almost as soon as perrault's tales became popular in france they were translated into english and speedily became indispensable in the nursery it is to be regretted that the popularity which attended them caused the disappearance of a great many of our own home-grown folk tales attempts were made in england to win the ears of little folk by fairy tales a couple of volumes were published in seventeen fifty but they lacked precisely that quality which was so conspicuous in perrault and so certain to ensure success with children simplicity both in structure of the plot and in diction though the stories in this collection have some merit they have none of them gained a hearing it was otherwise with grimm he did in germany on a more extended scale what perrault did in france and grimm's folk tales won their way to children's hearts at once and have established therein an empire which cannot be shaken grimm's success was due to the same cause as that of perrault the stories in this little book are all with two exceptions known in every nursery what i have done is to rewrite some of them i may say most of them simply and to eliminate the grandiloquent language which has clung to some of them and has not been shaken off madame d'aulnoy sinned greatly in style but nothing like the degree to which others sinned the original beauty in the beast is intolerable in the dress in which it was sent into the world what perrault did was to take traditional tales and clothe them in the language that was adapted to children of the end of the seventeenth century the tales were not original what he did was to print them undisfigured by fine language his great merit consists in having thought them worthy to be published perhaps the stories want telling a little differently to children at the close of the nineteenth century i have thought so and have so dealt with some but not all of these tales if i have made a mistake i am quite sure of one thing that the printer has made none in using such a beautiful type as can try no eyes and the artist has made none in supplying such delightful illustrations if i have made a mistake 
then i appeal to the tender hearts of the little people in the nursery and i know they will pardon me not only because i promise to make them up a set of really delightful old old english fairy tales but mainly because the childish heart is ever generous and forgiving s baring gould end of section one Section 2 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Travis Baldry. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Jack and the Beanstalk in the days of king alfred there lived in a lonesome part of england a poor widow with her son jack she had a cottage a meadow and a cowshed and one cow to eat in the meadow sleep in the shed and supply the cottage with milk and butter the widow had one son his name was jack and he was a thriftless idle lad without thought for his mother or the morrow she had to do all the work and he had all the pleasure if the widow had not petted and spoiled her boy, he would have been a comfort to her and not a trouble. If she had made him work instead of letting him run idle, he would have been happier. As her poverty increased and Jack increased at the same time and required larger shoes, longer stockings, and more broadcloth for his back, the mother disposed of all her little goods, one after another, to supply his necessities. He brought nothing into the housekeeping, but took a great deal out, and he had not the wits to see this. At length there remained only the cow to be disposed of, and the widow, with tears in her eyes, said to her son, "'Jack, my dear boy, I have not money enough to buy you a new suit of clothes, and you are out of elbows with your jacket, have knocked out the toes of your boots, and have worked your knees through to your breeches. Nothing remains for us but to part with the cow.' part with her we must i cannot bear to see you in rags and disreputable jack said his mother was quite right to consider his personal appearance then the widow bade him take the cow to market and sell her jack consented to do this as he was on his way he met with a butcher who asked him whither he was going with the cow jack said he was going to market to sell her what do you want for her asked the butcher as much as i can get answered jack that's spoken sensibly said the butcher and now i know with whom i have to deal it's always a pleasure to treat with a man of business habits and with plenty of intelligence with him one knows where one is but with a fool and a scatterbrain i ask where are you exactly said jack where are you jack was vastly gratified at being called a man and a man of business to boot, and with plenty of intelligence on top of that. Come, said the butcher, between you and me as businessmen, what will you take for the cow? Now he had in his hands some curious beans of various colors, red and violet, spotted purple and black. Jack had never seen the like before, and he looked curiously at them. Ah, said the butcher, I see you're a chap as knows what is what. In one moment, without speaking a word, them eyes of yours went into my hand, looking at my scarlet runners. There's no cheating you. You know the value of a thing by the outside. Girth, you do. Well, if I was dealing with anyone else, I'd say, three scarlet runner beans for the cow. But as you're an old hand and a weary bird, I'll give you six. Jack eagerly closed the bargain such a chance might never occur again so he gave the man the cow and walked home with the six beans in his hand when his mother saw the beans and heard what jack had to say her patience forsook her she threw away the beans in a rage and they were scattered all over the garden the poor woman was very sad over her loss she cried all evening and she and jack had to go supperless to bed when Jack awoke the next morning, he was surprised that the sun did not stream in at his window in the manner it was wont to do, but twinkled as through dense foliage. 
when he rose from his bed and went to the window he saw to his great astonishment that a large plant had sprung up in the night and had grown in front of the cottage and that its green leaves and scarlet flowers obscured the light from entering his chamber as fully as of old he ran downstairs into the garden and saw that the beans had taken root and had sprung up the stalks were entwined and twisted like a stout trunk or formed a ladder and this mounted quite out of sight for the clouds as they drifted by passed across the bean without ever reaching the top jack very speedily resolved to climb the beanstalk and see whither it mounted in the meantime his mother had come forth no less astonished than himself but when he told her it was his intention to scramble up the beanstalk then she entreated threatened and forbade him he must not go he would run extraordinary risks he would break her heart jack had been too long his own master and too regardless of his mother's feelings to pay attention to what she said he put his hands to the tangle of stalks and found it extremely easy to climb so he set to work and began his ascent pausing at intervals to look round and observe the scenery as it grew small below him after scrambling for several hours he passed through a thick layer of flaky cloud and found that the uppermost shoots and tendrils of the bean were there they had fallen over and were straggling across the upper surface of the cloud looking about him jack discovered that he was in a very strange country it appeared to be a desert without tree or shrub here and there were scattered masses of stone and here and there also were masses of crumbling soil jack was so fatigued that he sat himself down on a stone and thought of his mother and the distress she was in and a pang of remorse entered his heart then he heard the croak of a crow and looking up he saw a black bird perched on a rock it said to him Kara, Kara. i am a fairy and i will tell you why you are here your father was a great man and rich and one day a cruel giant came and killed him and carried off all his goods and unless your mother had hidden herself with you in the sheep pen he would have destroyed you both as well she fled with what little she could collect together carrying you on her back and she has lived ever since in great poverty and her poverty and sorrows have not been lightened by any signs of consideration and deference shown by you i am speaking to you now not that i care for you or desire to do you good for your own worthless sake but because i am grateful to your mother and i know that i cannot give her greater pleasure than by serving and saving you and i hope that in future you will behave better to her you must know that though i am a fairy my power is not continuous every hundred years there comes a time when it fails and i am obliged to live on earth subject to extreme poverty and privation and to be reduced to the utmost destitution and that i can only be released from this condition by one who will give me to eat her last crumb and to drink her last drop and will comb my head with her golden comb now yesterday whilst you were away driving the cow to market i came begging to your mother's door she was so good so charitable that she gave me the last particle of bread that remained in the house and the last drop of milk that remained in the pan and then seeing that i was without any of those articles of toilet which make life happy she seated me on a stool and with her golden comb the only article of luxury that remained to her she combed out my long black tresses now no sooner had she done this and spread my black hair all over me than i was transformed into a crow and as a crow i flew away and a crow i remain until i can peck the three golden hairs out of the mole that grows on the tip of the giant's nose that is of the giant who slew your father in order to reward your mother and also to advance my own interest i flew over you as you were making a great ass of yourself with the butcher who was laughing in his sleeve to think what a greenhorn you were and how easily gulled by a little vulgar flattery and i dropped among the scarlet runner beans three of a very different kind from those the butcher was giving you and it is these three magical beans out of fairyland that have grown to such a size and up which you have climbed you are now in the country where lives the giant 
you will have difficulties and dangers to encounter, but you must persevere in avenging the death of your father and in doing all you can to enable me to get the three golden hairs out of the mole at the end of the ogre's nose. One thing I charge you strictly. Do not let your mother know of your adventures till all are accomplished. The knowledge would be more than she could endure. Jack promised that he would obey the directions of the fairy. Then she said, Go along due east over this barren plain. You will soon arrive at the ogre's castle. Then the crow spread its wings and flew away. Jack walked on and on, till at last he saw a large mansion. A woman was standing in the doorway. He accosted her and begged a morsel of bread and a night's lodging, as he was desperately hungry and excessively weary. She expressed great surprise at seeing him, and said that it was an uncommon thing for a human being to pass that way, for it was well known that her husband was an ogre, who devoured human flesh in preference to all other meats, that he did not think anything of walking fifty miles to procure it, and that usually he was abroad all day questing for it. This account terrified Jack. Nevertheless, he was too weary and famished to think of proceeding further. Besides, he remembered the injunction of the fairy to avenge his father's death. He entreated the woman to take him in for that night only, and to lodge him in the oven. The good woman at length suffered herself to be persuaded, for she was of a compassionate disposition. She gave him plenty to eat and drink in the kitchen, where a pleasant fire was burning. Presently... The house shook, for the giant was approaching, and the woman hastily thrust Jack into the oven. Next instant the giant entered, and holding his nose high in the air, shouted in a voice of thunder, Ha! I smell fresh meat! My dear, answered his wife, it is only the calf we killed this morning. The ogre was appeased and called for his meal. The good woman hastened to satisfy him and spread the table and put on it a pie that would have taken ten men to consume it in ten days. The ogre finished it at a sitting, and when he had done, he desired his wife to bring him his crimson and gold hen. Jack could look through a crevice in the door of the oven, and he saw that the giant's wife, after having removed the supper, brought in an osier cage, and out of this cage took a hen that had the most magnificent plumage ever seen, shot with green and gold and crimson. When the giant said, Lay! Then at once the hen laid an egg of solid gold that shone like the sun. The ogre amused himself a long while with the hen. Meanwhile his wife was washing up the supper things in the back kitchen. At length the giant wearied of the somewhat monotonous sport, and fell fast asleep by his fireside, and Jack now stole out from the oven, tucked the hen under his arm, slipped through the house door, and ran as fast as his legs could carry him due west, till he reached the head of the beanstalk, and he descended it rapidly and successfully, always carrying the hen under his arm. His mother was overjoyed to see him. He found her crying bitterly and lamenting his fate, for she had been sure he had come to a shocking end through his rashness. Jack showed her the hen. "'See, mother,' said he, "'here's an end to our toil and trouble. Now I hope to make some amends for all the grief I've caused you.' The hen laid them as many eggs as they desired. They sold them, and in a little time they were rich enough to buy cows and a new suit for Jack and a best gown for his mother. But... Jack was not easy. He recollected the command of the fairy, that he was to avenge his father and work for her release from the form of a crow. Accordingly, he made up his mind to climb the beanstalk and visit Cloudland once more. One day he told his mother his purpose, and she tried to dissuade him from it. But as she saw that he was firmly resolved to do what he said, and with her fears to some extent allayed by the successful issue of his first expedition— she desisted from her attempt. Moreover, she did not know what dangers he would run, for, obedient to the instructions of the fairy, he had told her nothing of the ogre that lusted after human flesh and of his concealment in the oven. Knowing that the giant's wife would not again willingly admit and harbor him, 
he thought it necessary on this occasion to totally disguise himself. Accordingly, with walnut, he dyed his hands and face black and put on the new suit which had been purchased out of the money bought by the sale of the golden eggs. Very early one morning he started and climbed the beanstalk. He was greatly fatigued when he reached the top and very hungry. Having rested for some time on the stones, he pursued his journey to the ogre's castle. He reached it late in the evening, and he found the woman standing at the door as before. Jack accosted her and begged that she would give him a night's lodging and something to eat. She replied that the giant, her husband, ate human flesh in preference to all other meat, that on one occasion she had taken in and hidden a beggar boy who had run away carrying off something that her husband prized greatly. Jack tried hard to persuade the woman to receive him, but he found it a hard task. At length she yielded and took him into the kitchen where she gave him something to eat and drink and then concealed him in the clothes hutch. Presently the ogre entered with his nose in the air, shouting, Ha! Ha! I smell fresh meat. His wife replied that a kid had been killed that day, and this kid he doubtless scented. Then she hastened to produce his supper, for which he was very impatient, and constantly upbraided her with the loss of his hen. The giant at last, having satisfied his voracious appetite, said to his wife, "'Bring me the money-bags that I took out of the castle down on earth.' Then Jack knew that it was his father's money the ogre was going to look at. He peeped from his hiding-place and saw the woman enter carrying two money-bags into the room. She placed them before her husband, who at once opened them and poured forth from one bezants, that is to say gold coins, and from the other deniers, that is to say silver coins. The ogre amused himself with counting out his money, and Jack, peeping out from his hiding place, most heartily wished it were his. At length, the giant tired of the great mental exertion of counting, he put the money back into the bags, tied them up, and fell asleep. Jack, believing all was secure, stole from his hiding place and laid hold of one of the bags. Then a little dog that was lying under the table began to bark, and Jack, fearing lest the giant should wake, slipped back into his hiding place. He, however, remained unconscious, snoring heavily. Then the wife, who was washing up in the back kitchen, came in and called the dog to attend her. The coast was now clear. Jack crept out of the hutch, and seizing the bags, made off with them, as they were his father's treasure, which had been carried away by the giant. On his way to the top of the beanstalk, the only difficulty Jack had to encounter arose from the weight of the bags, which burdened him immensely. On reaching the bean plant, he climbed down nimbly, carrying the treasure of gold and silver with him, and on reaching the bottom gave them to his mother. They were now well off, and might have exchanged the cottage for a handsome house, but Jack would in no way consent to this, for he knew that he had not as yet avenged his father and released the fairy. He thought and thought upon the world above the beanstalk, and his mother saw that he was meditating on another expedition. She was sorrowful, as there was really now in her mind no need for anything further, but she knew how resolved her son was when he had made up his mind to anything, and that it was not in her power to dissuade him from it. One midsummer day, very early in the morning, Jack reascended the beanstalk, he found the plain above the clouds as before. He arrived at the giant's mansion in the evening and found his wife standing at the door. Jack had disguised himself so completely that she did not recognize him. He had painted his face and hands with red ochre. When he pleaded hunger and weariness in order to gain admission, he found it very difficult indeed to persuade her. At last he prevailed and was concealed in the copper. When the giant returned in the evening, he lifted his nose and bellowed, Ha! Ha! I smell fresh meat! Some crows have brought a piece of carrion and have left it on the roof, said the wife. I said fresh meat, retorted the giant, and notwithstanding all his wife could say, searched all through the kitchen. 
Jack was nearly dying with fear and wished himself at home, and when the ogre approached the copper and put his hand on the lid, Jack thought his last hour had struck. The giant, however, forbore from lifting the lid and threw himself into his chair, storming at his wife, whom he accused of having lost him his hen and bags of money. She hastened to dish up supper. He ate greedily, and when satiated, bade the woman bring him his harp. Jack peered from under the copper lid and saw the most beautiful harp that could be imagined. It had a head like an angel and wings. When the harp was placed on the table, the giant shouted, Play! Whereupon the harp played the most beautiful music of its own accord. The giant listened and fell asleep. Meanwhile, his wife had finished washing up and had retired to bed. Jack crept from the copper and laid hold of the harp, but the harp had instinct, and it cried out, Master! 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 The giant woke, rubbing his eyes, stretched himself, and looked about him. He had eaten and drunk so much that he was stupefied, and he did not understand what had happened in the first moment of being aroused. Meanwhile, Jack ran away with the harp. In a while, the giant discovered that he had been robbed, and he rushed after Jack and threw great stones at him, which Jack fortunately evaded. As soon as he reached the beanstalk, he began to descend, and he ran down as nimbly as might be, and the giant pursued him and began following down the beanstalk. Jack, on reaching the bottom, called for a hatchet. His mother, who saw the danger, immediately brought one, and Jack, with the axe, hewed through the stalks near the root. Consequently, the whole mass, with the giant on it, fell to the ground, and the fall broke the neck of the ogre. Immediately, hovering overhead, appeared the black crow. It swooped down and picked three golden hairs from a mole that was on the end of the giant's nose. No sooner was that done than the crow was transformed into a lovely fairy. Jack's mother was not a little delighted when she saw the beanstalk destroyed, for now Jack need no longer climb it. He was now allowed by the fairy to tell the whole story, and he not only did this, but begged his mother's pardon for disobedience in past years and promised to amend. He kept his promise, and what with the hen that laid golden eggs and the bag of Byzance and ten years, and the marvelous harp that played of its own accord, Jack and his mother no longer suffered poverty or felt tedium. Notes Jack and the Beanstalk This is probably a genuine old English folk tale. A trace of it is to be found in The Sage of Olaf Tryggvason. In dream he is said to have climbed a tree and got into a land of marvels above the clouds. The tree is Yggdrasil, the world tree that supports the firmament above. The giant who lives above the cloud floor is Odin, or Wotan, with his single eye, and with his wife Freya. Wotan is possessed of the red hen that lays the golden egg every morn, that is, the red dawn of which the sun is born, the harp that plays of itself, which is the wind, and the money and jewel bags, which are the clouds that drop fertilizing showers. End of section 2《Section 3 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adina Mignona. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Puss in Boots. A miller left all he had to his three sons. To the eldest he gave the mill. To the second he gave the ass, to the third the cat. Very sad was the youngest over what fell to him. The two eldest were not kind. They managed very well together. The first ground the corn into flour, and the second took it about in sacks on the ass and sold it. But the third could do nothing with the cat but keep the mill clear of rats and mice. One day he said, I am very much alone and very poor in the world, and I live on the charity of my brothers. They will soon turn me out, and then I shall die of hunger and cold whenever my cat has devoured the last mouse. The cat heard him, came and rubbed himself against his legs, and said, Do not be troubled, dear master. 
have a pair of boots made for me and give me a sack and you will soon see that you are better off with me than are your brothers with the mill and the ass. The young man had got a piece of gold in his pocket. It was all the money he had. He spent that in getting a pair of very handsome boots for his cat and he also got a sack as puss required. When the cat had got what he asked for, then he drew on his boots, they were topped with crimson leather, and he threw the sack over his shoulder and went away to a warren where there were many rabbits. Then he put some sow thistles and some bran at the bottom of the sack, and throwing himself down as though he were dead, he waited till some foolish young rabbit should come and be snared. Nor had he long to wait, for very soon a silly bunny came up, and attracted by what was in the sack, went in. Then the cat drew the cords that shut the neck of the sack and killed the rabbit. Very proud of what he had done, he went to the king's palace and asked to speak with his majesty. He was readily admitted when, marching in his boots to the foot of the throne, he made a profound bow and throwing down the rabbit on the steps of the dais said, Sire, the Marquess of Carabas has enjoined me to present you with a rabbit from his warren. With onion sauce, boiled, your majesty will find it excellent. Tell your master, answered the king, that he could hardly have afforded me a greater pleasure. My cook never dreams of sending me up rabbit on which I dote. Thank him cordially from me. Next day, the cat concealed himself in the standing corn with his sack open. Soon, two partridges entered. He drew the strings and caught them. Then again, he went to the palace and presented them to the king in the name of his master, the Marquess of Carabas. The king was delighted and ordered that the messenger should be given something to drink. The cat asked for a saucer full of milk. He touched nothing stronger, said he. On principle, he was a teetotaler. The cat continued his course. He caught in like manner pheasant, woodcock, snipe, teal, wild duck, field fare, and kept the palace larder pretty well supplied with game during the season. One day, when the cat knew that the king was going out a drive beside the river, along with his daughter, who was the loveliest princess in the world and heir to his throne, the cat said to his master, If you will follow my advice, your fortune is made. You have but to bathe in the river at the spot I shall point out to you, and leave the rest to me. The young fellow did as was advised without understanding what was the purpose of the cat. Whilst he was in the water, the carriage of the king drew near. It was gilded and had glass windows, and was drawn by cream-colored horses with gold and red trappings. The cat now began to run up and down the bank, screaming, Help! Help! My master, the Marquess of Carabas, will be drowned! The king, hearing the cries, put his head out of the window and bade the coachman draw up. Then he recognized the cat, which had brought him so many good things. He called the cat to the carriage side and asked what distressed him. Sire, answered the cat, Whilst the most noble, the Marquess of Carabas, has been bathing, some thieves have run away with his clothes. I am afraid if he remains much longer in the water, he may have cramp and go under. In fact, the cat had carried away his master's poor, mean garments and had hidden them under a stone. The king, who was not merely compassionate, but also generous and not above feeling gratitude for services rendered, at once ordered his attendants to go back to the palace for the most splendid suit they could find. I believe, said the king, there is a very fine suit made for me some twenty years ago when I was a courting. I was then less corpulent than at present. You will find it in the lower right-hand drawer of the mahogany chest. I have little doubt it will fit the Marquess to a nicety. That is, if he is a graceful man. I was immensely graceful twenty years ago. Owing to the minute and exact instruction given by His Majesty, the suit, which was exceedingly splendid, was soon found and brought to the lad in the water, who quickly clothed himself in it, and then came to the coach door to pay his respects to the king and the princess. The youth looked so engaging in the dress in which his royal highness had been invested when he went courting her mother that the princess immediately lost her heart to him, and felt that the world to her would be a blank without him. The king was also touched, for the sight of the youth in his suit, which he became rather than the suit became him, awoke old feelings of sentimentality in the bosom of the king. He wiped his eyes and entreated the most noble Marquess to enter the carriage with him and his daughter, and nudging the princess, he whispered, I was like that when I went to sweethearting. The cat, delighted that his schemes had so well succeeded, ran on ahead of the carriage, 
And having passed through a field in which harvesters were cutting and making stacks of golden corn, he said to them, Good people, unless you tell the king who is coming this way that these cornfields belong to the Marquess of Carabas, you will all be made mincemeat of. The harvesters were somewhat alarmed at the appearance of the cat in boots. They were exceedingly afraid of being made into mincemeat. Presently, the gilded coach of the king passed. He stopped it and inquired of the peasants to whom these splendid fields of grain belonged. They answered, as they had been instructed, to the most noble, the Marquess of Carabas. Upon my word, said the king, addressing the miller's son, you have a noble heritage. The young man bowed and blushed, and the king and princess were pleased at his modesty. The king nudged his daughter and whispered, I was tremendously shy when I went to courting. The cat ran ahead and came into a meadow in which were mowers making hay. He said to them, Good people, unless you tell the king who is coming this way that these meadows belong to the Marquess of Carabas, you will all be pickled like young walnuts. When the king soon after came into the meadow and smelt the sweet hay, he bade the coach stop, and he inquired of the mowers to whom the meadows belonged. They answered, as instructed, that they belonged to the most noble, the Marquess of Carabas. Goodness, exclaimed the king, addressing the miller's son, you have indeed a noble heritage. The young man stammered something unintelligible. The king nudged his daughter and said in a whisper, I also stuttered and stammered when I was paying my addresses to your mother. The cat ran on and passed through a forest in which woodcutters were engaged thinning the timber. He halted and addressed them and said, Good people, unless you say that all these woods belong to the Marquess of Carabas, you will all be stewed in your syrup like prunes. When soon after this the king's coach entered the woods, the king called to the driver to stop, and he signed to a woodcutter to come up. He asked him whose forests these were, and he replied that they would belong to the most noble, the Marquess of Carabas. Well, I never, exclaimed the king to the miller's son. You have verily a splendid inheritance. The poor lad was so bewildered that all he could do was to respond with a sickly smile. The king nudged his daughter and whispered, I also sniggered when I asked your mother to name the day. She said my snigger was more eloquent than words. The cat ran on and saw at the end of the wood a magnificent palace. He went in and found that it belonged to an ogre, who was also a magician and enormously rich, for all the lands through which the cat had run belonged to the domain of this palace. The cat asked leave to see the ogre. He said he could not think of passing that way without paying him his respects. The ogre received him with civility. Even ogres enjoy flattery. I have been informed, said the cat, that you are so clever and so profound in your acquirements that you can transform yourself into any shape you like. But this may be merely idle gossip, not based on any foundation of truth. For myself, I never believe half the tittle-tattle I hear. But it is really true, said the ogre. The cat smiled incredulously. I will at once show you my power, said the ogre, and in a moment transformed himself into a lion. The cat was so frightened that he made a bolt out of the window and ran up the water pipes and did not rest till he was on the roof. This was difficult for him because he wore boots, and boots are calculated for a high road and not for scrambling. After some time, he plucked up courage to descend. What do you think of my power now? asked the ogre, who had resumed his former shape. I think that your power is great, answered the cat, yet hardly all that I should have thought had I given belief to what is said. How so? asked the ogre. I heard, for instance, on my way here, that you were a great bear. I could make myself that in a moment, answered the ogre. I am sure you are that already, answered the cat courteously. Others said you were an awful boar, or boar. I did not ask them to spell the word. I can transform myself into that instantly. I am certain you need no transformation to be that most completely, said the cat with a bow. I also heard that you were in reality quite insignificant as a personage, and nobody. Now, any fool can puff himself up into something greater than himself, but it takes a wise man to make himself appear less than he really is. Can you do that? In a moment, answered the ogre, and he changed himself into a mouse. Instantly, the cat was on him and had eaten him. 
Then he walked to the gate of the palace and arrived there just as the royal carriage drove up. I wonder whose magnificent palace this is, said the king. Then the cat ran down the steps, opened the door of the carriage, and said, Your Majesty, welcome to the palace of the most noble Marquess of Carabas. Why, this is truly a surprise, said the king. What a splendid inheritance is yours, Marquess. Give my daughter your arm. We will pick a crumb with you, Carabas. I'm vastly hungry with my drive. The miller's son clumsily offered his arm as bidden to the princess. Her father nudged her and whispered, I was also a great gawky when I proposed to your mother. Then all entered the great hall, and the king could not contain his surprise and admiration at all he saw. The cat ran down into the kitchen and ordered up a cold collation, and into the cellars where he chose out the best wines, and the king said he had never enjoyed his victual so heartily as that day. Then turning to the miller's son, he said, If you like, Carabas, you shall be my son-in-law. Say, I adore you, will you be mine, to the princess. I did that when I solicited the hand of her mother. The miller's son did not wait to be told this a second time. The princess at once accepted him, and they were married and lived happily. The cat became a great lord and had no occasion to run after and eat mice. Notes on Puss in Boots This story was taken by Perrault from the first of the eleventh night of Streparola, whose collection of tales was printed at Venice in 1550 and 1554. Straparola himself borrowed from earlier writers. End of section 3 Recording by Adina Mignona Section 4 from A Book of Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Tara Tucker, www.terahlynn.com. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Cinderella There was once a gentleman, a widower, who took for his second wife a lady who was a widow with two daughters. He, for his part, had a daughter by his first wife. The second wife was extremely proud and haughty in her demeanor, and her two daughters had inherited their mother's qualities. The gentleman's daughter by his first wife was most amiable and gentle, in which points she resembled her own mother. No sooner had the marriage taken place than the ill humor of the stepmother became manifest. She became jealous of the good qualities in the child, which made her own daughters appear by contrast the more disagreeable. She put upon her all the meanest tasks and held her to them with inexorable severity. The young girl had to clean pots and pans, to scrub the floors and sweep the steps. She was obliged to do all the servile work of the house and be as a slave to her half-sisters. For a bed she was given an old straw palace in an attic where it was cold, and where ran the rats, whereas her sisters occupied the best rooms in the house and feather beds. They had also in their rooms cheval glasses in which they could admire themselves from top to toe. The poor girl endured all without complaining. She did not dare to speak to her father about it, because he was completely under the thumb of his new wife. Moreover, he was much engaged in business which carried him away from home for weeks together, and she considered that if she were to speak to him about her treatment, her stepmother and sisters would serve her still worse as soon as his back was turned. When she had done her daily tasks, she was wont to creep into a corner of the fireplace and sat among the cinders, for which reason her eldest sister called her Cinderslut, but the second, who was not quite so ill-tempered as the other, called her Cinderella. Although, poor girl, she was given the shabbiest clothes and the dirtiest occupation, she was a hundred times more beautiful than her sisters in their finest dresses. It happened that the king gave a ball, to which were invited all persons of quality. Amongst others, the two young ladies of the house received invitation— no one thought of Cinderella, for no one knew of her existence, or if at any time they had known, 
they had forgotten her since she had been banished to the kitchen. The two daughters of the lady were greatly excited about the ball. They discussed how they should be dressed and how they would have their hair done up and what jewels they would wear. "'For my part,' said the eldest, "'I will wear red velvet and lace and a turban of red and yellow with an ostrich feather.' "'And I,' said the younger, "'I shall wear sear green velvet and satin embroidered with gold, "'and I will frizzle up my hair and tie it with amber silk ribbons.' When the time approached, they made Cinderella lace them and patch them and paint them and frizzle them and shoe them. "'How would you like to be at the ball?' asked one of the sisters of Cinderella. "'As for me,' answered she, I do not think a king's palace is the place for me, nor would my sooty and soiled gown appear to advantage in a ballroom. That is true indeed, laughed one of the sisters. That would be a rare joke to see you at the ball. And what a fool you would look if the prince asked you to dance a minuet, said the other. For two days before the ball, the two damsels ate nothing. They were desirous to have the smallest waists of any ladies who appeared, and in lacing them, Cinderella broke a score of laces before she had got them done up tightly enough to satisfy their vanity. When it came to patching, the sisters were extremely particular. I, said one, will have a square patch on the top of my nose. I think it will heighten my complexion. "'And I,' said the other, "'will have a round one in the middle of my forehead. "'It will make me so interesting.' "'When the young ladies departed with their mother, "'then Cinderella was left quite alone in the house. "'She sat herself on a heap of ashes in the corner of the fireplace "'and began to cry. "'Then, all at once, the hearth opened, "'and up through it came a little woman with a red cloak "'and a black pointed hat.' This was her godmother, who was a fairy. The fairy godmother asked Cinderella why she was crying. Cinderella could only stammer, I wish, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. I see clearly, said the godmother, that you also would like to go to the ball. Is that so? Indeed, indeed I should, sobbed the poor girl. Very well, then, so you shall. "'Go into the garden and bring me a pumpkin.' "'Cinderella at once went to pick the finest she could find. "'It was yellow streaked with green. "'She took it to her godmother, but had no idea what would be done with it. "'The fairy scooped out the inside, leaving only the skin. "'Then she tapped it with her staff, "'and in a moment it was changed into the most beautiful coach, gold and green. "'Now!' said she, bring me the mouse trap. Cinderella obeyed. In the mouse trap were six little mice. The fairy opened the door, and as the mice ran out, she gave each a tap with her rod, and it was transformed into a beautiful horse with flowing mane and tail. She then attached the six horses to the coach. The horses were all of a beautiful brownish gray. What are we to do for a coachman? asked Cinderella. Fetch me the rat trap said the godmother. The girl did as desired. In it were three rats. The fairy took the fattest, and with a touch of her wand changed him into a pompous and dignified coachman. Then she said, Go into the garden, and you will there find six lizards behind the watering pot. Bring them to me. No sooner had Cinderella done what was commanded than the fairy changed them dexterously into six sleek lackeys, which mounted behind the coach and hung on to it with all the grace and facility as if they had been bred to it. The fairy then said to Cinderella, There now, you are set up with a conveyance in which to go to the ball. That is very true, answered the girl, but alas, my clothes are so mean and soiled that I shall be ashamed to get out of my beautiful coach. That is easily remedied, said the fairy, and she touched the garments worn by her godchild. They were at once changed into the most splendid silk, studded with diamonds. And now, to make you complete, said the fairy, I give you two glass slippers, the only ones there are in the world. 
When Cinderella was thus dressed, she mounted her carriage and thanked her godmother gratefully. The good fairy said to her, I am well pleased that you should enjoy yourself, but remember to leave before midnight. If you remain a moment after the last stroke of the clock, then your carriage will turn into a pumpkin, your horses into mice, your driver into a rat, your flunkies into lizards, and all your beautiful garments will revert to the condition of dirty, patched rags. Cinderella promised her godmother to remember what she had said, and to return most certainly before midnight. Then she started, with a heart bounding with joy. When she arrived at the palace, it was announced to the prince, the king's son, that a lady in the most splendid equipage ever seen was at the gates, and that she would not give her name. The prince at once ran out to salute her and invite her to the ball. He gave her his hand to help her to descend, and led her into the great hall where the company was assembled. Then a great silence fell on all. The dancers ceased dancing, the musicians ceased playing, and the gossips ceased gossiping. All were eager to see the strange princess. On all sides were heard whispers of, What a radiant beauty! What superb jewels! What an exquisite dress! Who could have been her milliner? What a style in the doing of her hair! Who could have been her hairdresser? What wonderful slippers! Who could have been her shoemaker? The king, although old, could hardly take his eyes off her, and he whispered to the queen that, except herself, he had never seen a greater beauty. The queen, who was old and fat, accepted the compliment gracefully and smiled. All the ladies observed Cinderella attentively, and endeavored to engrave in their memories every detail of her dress, so as to get their next ball dresses made like it. The son of the king seated Cinderella in the most honorable place, danced with her, and himself brought her refreshments. As for himself, he could eat nothing, so taken up was he with attention to her, and in admiration of her beauty. Cinderella seated herself by her sisters, and was very civil to them. She gave them some of the oranges the prince had peeled for her, and talked to them most sweetly. They were lost in astonishment, and never for an instant recognized her. Presently, Cinderella heard the clock strike a quarter to twelve. Then she rose, made a graceful curtsy to the king and queen, and to the company, and hastened away. On her return home, she found her godmother in the chimney corner. She thanked the fairy for the favor granted her, and begged that she might be allowed to go to the ball at the palace on the following night, as the prince had expressly invited her. Whilst she was thus talking, she heard the coach drive up that conveyed home her sisters and their mother. She hastened to the door, opened for them, yawned, and rubbed her eyes, and said, "'How late you are! It must be past one o'clock!' "'Aha!' exclaimed her eldest sister. "'You have missed something. There has been not only a most splendid entertainment, but there arrived at it a most illustrious princess, so beautiful, that she nearly came up to me.' "'And to me!' said the second, and she was most superbly dressed. Her taste was almost equal to mine. And to mine, said the second. She was very civil to us, and gave us some of her oranges. Indeed, for ease and graceful courtesy, I should say she almost came up to me. And to me, said the second. Cinderella listened to all that was said with great interest. She asked the name of the princess. But that, said her sisters, is not known. The king's son did his utmost to find out and failed. He says he would give a great deal to know it. Oh, dear, dear, said Cinderella. I should like to see her. Do, dear sisters, let me go with you tomorrow night. Spare me some of your clothes. I should like to see this princess. Hoity-toity, this is a fine idea exclaimed the sisters. We should die of shame to be seen at a great ball with such as you, and have it known, too, that we were related. 
Cinderella expected this refusal. She was not sorry. She would have been sorely embarrassed if the sisters had consented to lend her their clothes and take her with them. Next evening the sisters departed for the ball, and all happened as on the previous night. This time Cinderella was even more splendidly dressed than on the first night. The king's son was all the evening at her side, and said to her the prettiest things imaginable. Cinderella was so happy that the time passed unobserved, and she forgot what her grandmother had said to her, so that she heard the first stroke of twelve when she supposed it was only eleven o'clock. Then she sprang from her seat and fled as swiftly as a fawn. The prince followed her, but could not overtake her. However, in her flight she let fall one of her glass slippers, and as the prince stooped to pick it up, she vanished. Cinderella arrived at home, panting, in her soiled and patched dress, on foot, without coach and attendants. Nothing of all her magnificence remained except the odd glass slipper. The prince inquired of the guards at the palace gate if they had seen a beautiful princess pass, and which way her coach had gone. But they declared that no one except a scullery maid had passed that way, and upon looking for her coach it was nowhere to be seen. When the two sisters returned from the ball, Cinderella asked them if they had enjoyed themselves, and if the beautiful lady had been there. They replied that she had, but that she had fled at the stroke of twelve, and had left behind a glass slipper, the most lovely that could be conceived that the king's son had picked it up, and that he had been quite disconsolate after she had disappeared, and had refused to dance or to eat or drink anything, but had sat in a corner sighing and looking at the glass slipper. On the following morning the town was aroused by the blowing of trumpets, and upon the people coming out to know the occasion, they found the royal heralds with a chamberlain and guards, and an attendant carrying a crimson velvet cushion, upon which was placed the glass slipper. The chamberlain announced that all single ladies were to try on the glass slipper, and that the prince had declared he would marry the one whom it would fit. The slipper was tried first on the princesses, then on all the noble ladies, then on all the court ladies, but in vain. Their feet were too large. Then it was tried on in the town by the daughters of the citizens, and the chamberlain brought it to the house of the sisters. The eldest saw at a glance that her foot would not go in, so she made an excuse, ran into the kitchen, and cut off her toes. But even so her foot would not fit into the shoe, and she was obliged to abandon the attempt. Then it was offered to the second sister. She saw at a glance that it was too small for her foot, so she ran into the kitchen and cut off her heel. But even so she could not get her foot into the glass slipper. The chamberlain was about to leave when he caught sight of Cinderella in the chimney corner, and he requested her to try on the glass slipper. The sisters set up a loud laugh and said, The idea was ridiculous. However, the chamberlain insisted on it, and no sooner was the glass slipper put to her foot than it slipped on as if made for it. The amazement of the sisters was great, but it was greater still when Cinderella produced the other slipper, the fellow, from her pocket and put it on her foot. Then the hearth opened, and through it rose the fairy godmother. She touched Cinderella, and her clothes became more beautiful and costly than those she had worn at the balls. Then her sisters recognized her as the princess they had seen and admired. They threw themselves at her feet and implored pardon for all the injuries they had done her. Cinderella raised them and kissed them, and said that they could make up for the past by loving her for the future. The fairy godmother then said that Cinderella must go to the court in a splendid equipage, whereupon, as by magic, the gilded coach drawn by six greys, with the pompous coachman on the box, and the six lackeys behind, drew up at the door. In this she drove to the palace, where she was well received by the prince, who thought her more beautiful by daylight than by that of candles. 
A few days after, there was a grand marriage. After that, Cinderella got her sisters to lodge in apartments in the palace, and after a little urgency, two noblemen were persuaded to marry the sisters, who sincerely promised and vowed on their side to be better tempered in their married state than they had been as spinsters. And the noblemen promised and vowed, on their part, if they did not, they would give them shabby clothes and smut their faces till they became amiable again. Extra Notes for Cinderella This story is given by Peralt. Its counterparts are to be found in every European folk store of tales. An exhaustive notice of all the analogues has been published by the Folklore Society. The English form of the tale Catskin has been displaced by the French Cinderella. I hope to give Catskin in the oldest English fairy tales. In German, the story is Aschenputtel. It was certainly known in Germany at the beginning of the 16th century, for it is referred to by Thomas Murner in 1515. In Scotland, Cinderella was called Asipet or Ashipetel. There are traces of the story in very remote antiquity. Strabo tells the story of Rhodopis, who by losing her slipper became queen of Egypt, and the same tale is referred to by Aelian. The tale is this. Rhodopis was one day bathing when an eagle picked up one of her sandals and flew away with it and dropped it in the lap of the Egyptian king as he was administering justice at Memphis. Surprised at its smallness and beauty, he had no rest till he found the owner of the sandal, and then he raised her from the basest and most despised condition to be his queen. The old German Hildenlied of Gudron is but a version of the Ashputel fable. Heralt took his story from the Pentameron. End of section 4《セクション5 of a book of fairy tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan. A book of fairy tales by Sabine Barring Gold. Valentine and Orson. Chapter 1. Pepin, king of the Franks, had a sister named Bellisance, who was exceedingly beautiful, and who was asked in marriage by many kings and princes. The lady's choice fell upon Alexander, emperor of Constantinople, who came to the court of King Pepin to marry the princess. Great rejoicings took place on the occasion in all parts of the kingdom, and soon after the marriage the emperor took his leave and carried his lovely bride in great splendor and triumph to Constantinople. The emperor, Alexander's prime minister, was a selfish and subtle man. Unhappily, his influence with the emperor was very great. This man, observing the gentleness and sweetness of the Lady Bellisance, began to fear that she would undermine his influence, and he wickedly resolved to seek the destruction of the innocent Empress. The Emperor was of a credulous and suspicious temper, and the Prime Minister found means at length to infuse into his mind suspicions of the Empress. One day, when the Emperor was alone, he entered the apartment, and throwing himself at his master's feet, said, May heaven guard your majesty from the base attempts of the wicked and treacherous. I seek not the death of any man, nor may I reveal the name of the person who has entrusted to me a dreadful secret. But, in the most solemn manner, I conjure your majesty to beware of the designs of your empress. For that beautiful and clever lady is faithless and disloyal, and is even now planning your dethronement. Alas, my heart is ready to burst with indignation. To think that a lady of such charms, and the sister of a great king, should become so dishonorable and wicked. The emperor, giving perfect faith to his favorite's tale, could no longer restrain his fury, and abruptly leaving him, he rushed into the apartment of the empress, and in the fiercest manner dragged the fair Bellisance about the chamber by her long and beautiful hair. Alack, my dear lord, she cried, what causes you to commit this outrage? Base wretch, he exclaimed. I am but too well informed of your wicked proceedings. Then dashing her with violence upon the ground, he left her speechless. The attendants of the empress, finding her lying senseless on the floor, uttered loud screams, which presently brought all the courtiers into the chamber. Everyone was sorry for their amiable queen, and the nobles demanded an audience of the emperor to represent to him the wrongs he had done to an honorable lady, with whom no one before had ever found any fault. But the emperor was still blinded with passion, 
and to their representations he answered, Let no man dare to defend a woman who has basely betrayed me. She shall die, and they who interfere in her behalf shall partake in the dreadful punishment that awaits treason. The empress, on recovery from her swoon, fell upon her knees, and thus addressed the emperor, Alas, my lord, take pity on one who never harbored any evil thought against your person or dignity. And if not upon me, at least I implore you have compassion on your two children. Let me be imprisoned or put to death, if it so pleaseth you. But I beseech you, save my poor children. The rash emperor, misled by the false tales of the prime minister, would not hearken to her, and the courtiers, perceiving that nothing could mitigate his rage, removed Bellisance from his presence. Her faithful servant, Blandaman, now threw himself at her feet, exclaiming, Ah, madam, let me prevail on you to quit this unhappy place, and suffer me to conduct you and your children to your brother, the good King Pepin. Innocent and noble lady, follow my counsel, for if you stay here, the emperor will bring you to a shameful death. No, my faithful servant, replied she, I cannot follow your advice. If I should steal away privately from the court, it might be said I had fled because I was guilty. No, I had rather die the most cruel death than bear the blame of that of which I am innocent. The emperor so far relented that he would not pronounce sentence of execution upon his queen. Yet, as his mind was continually excited by false accusations against her, he resolved to banish her from his dominions and immediately commanded her to quit Constantinople. At the same time, he published an edict forbidding all persons on pain of death to assist or succor the unfortunate lady, allowing her no other attendant than her servant Blandaman, whom she had brought with her from France. Sentence having been thus pronounced, the queen, Blandaman, and the two children hastened away. As she passed through the city, she was met by multitudes of people lamenting the loss of so good an empress. When she had left Constantinople, alas, cried she, in what unhappy hour was I born? to fall from so high an estate to so low a condition as I am now in. As she was thus complaining and weeping with anguish, her servant said to her, Madam, be not discomforted, but trust in God who will keep and defend you. He had hardly spoken before he espied a fountain which he and his lady at once approached. After refreshing themselves at the fountain, they proceeded towards friends. Many weary days and nights had been spent in travel when, arriving in the forest of Orleans, the disconsolate princess was so overcome with grief and fatigue that she sank and was incapable of proceeding farther. Her faithful attendant gathered the fallen leaves and the moss to make a couch for her on which to rest, and then hastened away to seek some habitation where he might procure food for his unfortunate mistress. During Blandaman's absence, the empress fell asleep, with her two infant boys laid on the couch beside her, when suddenly a huge bear rushed out of the forest and, snatching up one of the children in his mouth, disappeared with his prey. The wretched mother, distracted at the fate of her child, pursued the bear with shrieks and lamentations, till, overcome with anguish and terror, she fell into a swoon near the mouth of the cave into which the bear had carried her child. It happened that King Pepin, accompanied by several great lords and barons of his court, was that same day hunting in the forest of Orleans, and chanced to pass near the tree where the other little boy lay sleeping on his bed of moss. The king was astonished with the beauty of the child, who opened his eyes as the king stood gazing on him, and smiling stretched out his little arms as if to ask protection. See, my lord, said King Pepin, this lovely infant seems to ask my favor. Here is no one to claim it, and I will adopt it for my own. The king little imagined it was his nephew, the son of his sister Bellisance, that he now delivered into the hands of one of his pages, who took the babe to Orleans to be nursed and gave it, by the king's orders, the name of Valentine, because it was found on St. Valentine's Day. Blandaman, who had now returned after looking in vain for assistance, missed his mistress, and after searching the forest for her, he at length espied her on the ground, tearing her hair and uttering piercing cries of grief. Ah, Blandaman, she exclaimed, can there exist in the world a being more encompassed with grief and sorrow? I left Constantinople the mother of two beautiful children, my only comfort under my bitter sorrow. A ravenous bear has now snatched one from my arms, and a no less cruel beast of prey has doubtless devoured the other. At the foot of yonder tree I left it when I pursued the bear, but no trace of either of my children remains. 
Go, bland the man, leave me here to perish, and tell the emperor of Constantinople to what a horrible fate, by listening to evil counsel, he has destined his innocent wife and children. At this moment they were interrupted by the sudden appearance of a huge giant, who immediately attempted to seize the empress. Blandiman sprang to his feet, stepped before him, and began to draw and defend himself. His efforts, however, were unavailing. The giant prevailed and slew him, and throwing the unfortunate lady over his shoulder, proceeded towards his castle. Chapter 2 Meantime, the bear that had carried away the infant bore it to its cave and laid it down unhurt before her young ones. The young bears, however, did not devour it, but stroked it with their rough paws, and the old bear, perceiving their kindness for the little babe, gave it milk and nourished it in this manner for the space of a whole year. The boy became hardy and robust, and as he grew in strength, he began to range the forest and attack the wild beasts with such fury that they used to shun the cave where he continued to live with the old bear, who loved him with extreme fondness. He passed eighteen years in this kind of life, and grew to such wonderful strength that he was the terror of the neighboring country. The name of Orson was given to him, because he was nurtured by a bear, and the renown of this wild man spread over all France. He could not speak and utter no other sounds than a wild kind of growl to express either his anger or his joy. King Pepin often entertained a great desire to see this wild man of the woods, and one day rode with his retinue into the forest of Orleans in hopes of meeting him. The king left his train at some distance, rode on, and passed near the cave which Orson inhabited. On hearing the sound of horses' feet, the wild man rushed upon the king, and would have strangled him in an instant but for a valiant knight, who galloped up and wounded Orson with his sword. Orson then quitted the king, and running furiously upon the knight, caught him and his horse and overthrew both. The king, being quite unarmed, could not assist the knight, but rode away to call the attendants to his rescue. However, before they arrived on the spot, the unfortunate knight was torn to pieces, and Orson had fled to the thickest part of the forest, where notwithstanding all their endeavors, they could not discover him. The noise of this adventure increased every one's terror of the wild man, and the neighboring villages were nearly abandoned by their inhabitants. Valentine, in the meanwhile, had been educated in all kinds of accomplishments, with the king's two sons and his fair daughter, Eglantine. Nothing could exceed the fondness of the young people for each other. Indeed, there was never a lovelier princess than Eglantine, or a more brave and accomplished youth than Valentine. The king, observing his inclination for arms, indulged him with armor and horses, and after creating him knight, gave him a command in his army that was about to march against the Saracens. Valentine soon distinguished himself above the other leaders in battle. He fought near the king's side, and when his majesty was taken by a troop of the pagans, Valentine rushed through their ranks, slew hundreds of them, and replacing the king on his horse, led him off in triumph. Afterwards, when the Saracen's city was besieged, he was the first to scale the walls and place the Christian standard on the battlements. By his means, a complete victory was obtained, and peace restored to France. Having conquered the Saracens, Valentine returned to the court of King Pepin, and was received with loud acclamations by the people, and joyfully welcomed by the princess Eglantine. The distinctions and favors showered on him raised the envy and hatred of the king's sons, who plotted together to destroy Valentine. It happened very shortly after the return of Valentine from his victory over the Saracens that a petition was presented to the king by a deputation of peasants praying relief against Orson, the wild man of the woods, the fear of whom was now become so great that the peasants dared not go out to till their fields nor the shepherds to watch their flocks. The king immediately issued a proclamation saying, If any man would undertake to bring Orson dead or alive to the city, he should receive a thousand marks of gold. Sire, said his sons, we think no person is proper to undertake this enterprise as the foundling Valentine, on whom your majesty lavishes such great favors, and who, it seems, aspires to the hand of your daughter. Perhaps if he conquers the savage with his sword, you would not think it then too much to reward him with the hand of our sister Eglantine. Valentine saw through the malicious design of the king's sons, and the king himself wished to protect him, and advised him not to encounter such an enemy. Pardon me, my liege, replied Valentine. It concerns my honor that I go. I will encounter this danger and every other, rather than not prove myself worthy of your majesty's favor and protection. Tomorrow I will depart for the forest at break of day. 
When the Princess Eglantine heard of Valentine's determination, she sought to turn him from his purpose, but finding him inflexibly resolved to attack the wild man, she adorned him with a scarf embroidered by her own hands and then retired to her chamber to pray for his safety. At the first dawn of morning, Valentine arose, put on his armor, and with his shield polished like a mirror, he departed for the forest. On his arrival there, he alighted, tied his horse to a tree, and penetrated into the thickest part of the wood in search of Orson. He wandered about a long time in vain, till coming near the mouth of a large cave, he thought that might be the hiding place of the wild man. Valentine then climbed a high tree near the cave, and scarcely was he seated among the branches before he heard Orson's roar in the forest. Orson had been hunting, and came with a swift pace, bearing upon his shoulder a buck he had killed. Valentine could not help admiring the beauty of his person, the grace and freedom of his motions, and his appearance of strength and agility. He felt a species of affection for the wild man, and wished it were possible to tame him without having recourse to weapons. Valentine now tore off a branch of the tree and threw it at Orson's feet, who, looking up and espying Valentine in the tree, uttered a growl of fury and darted up the tree like lightning. Valentine as quickly slipped down on the other side. Orson, seeing him on the ground, leaped from the tree and, opening his arms, prepared in his usual manner to rush upon and overthrow his antagonist. But Valentine, holding up his polished steel shield, Orson suddenly beheld, instead of the person he meant to seize, his own wild and terror-striking figure. Upon Valentine's lowering the shield, he again saw his enemy, and with a cry of transport prepared to grasp him in his arms. The strength of Orson was so very great that Valentine was unable to defend himself without having recourse to his sword. When Orson received a wound from the sword, he uttered loud shrieks of anger and surprise, and instantly tearing up by the roots a large tree, furiously attacked Valentine. A dreadful fight now ensued, and the victory was a long time doubtful. Orson received many dreadful wounds from the sword of Valentine, and Valentine with great difficulty escaped from being crushed to death beneath the weighty club of Orson. At last Valentine's skill prevailed, and the wild man was conquered and laid prostrate on the ground at his feet. Valentine now made signs to Orson that he wished him to accompany him, on which he quietly suffered his hands to be bound. And Valentine, having mounted his horse, the two brothers proceeded towards Orleans. Chapter 3 Wherever they passed, the people on seeing the wild man ran into their houses and hid themselves. When Valentine arrived at an inn where he intended to rest during the night, the terrified inhabitants fastened their doors and would not suffer them to enter. Valentine made signs to Orson, who placed his shoulder against the door and forced it open in an instant, upon which the people of the inn all ran out at the back door and would not venture to return. A great feast was in preparation, and there was plenty of fowls and good provisions roasting at the fire. Orson tore the meat off the spit with his hands and devoured it greedily, in a spine a cauldron of water, he put his head into it and drank like a horse. In the morning, Valentine resumed his journey, leading Orson as before. On arriving at the city, the inhabitants shut their doors and ran into the highest rooms to gaze upon the wild man. When they reached the outer court of King Pepin's palace, the porter, in a great fright, barred the gate with heavy chains and bars of iron and would not be prevailed upon to open it. After soliciting admittance for some time, and being still denied, Valentine made a sign to Orson, who, tearing up one of the large stone posts that stood by, shattered the gate to pieces. The queen, the princess Eglantine, and all their attendants fled to hide themselves when they heard that Orson was arrived, and Valentine had the greatest difficulty to persuade them to believe that Orson was no longer furious and savage as he had been in the woods. At length, the king permitted him to be brought in and the whole court soon gathered in a crowd in the apartment, and were much amused by his wild actions and gestures, although they were very cautious not to come near him. On Valentine's making signs, he kissed the king's robe and the hand of the princess Eglantine, for Orson had now become so attached to Valentine that he would obey him in all things, and would suffer no other person to attempt to control him. If Valentine went for a moment out of his sight, he would utter cries of distress and overturn every one that stood in his way while he ran about the palace in search of him, and he slept at night in Valentine's chamber on the floor, for he could not be prevailed to lie on a bed. 
very soon after the capture of Orson, a herald appeared at the court of King Pepin from the Duke of Aquitaine, summoning all true knights to avenge the cause of the Lady Claremont, daughter to the noble Duke, who was held in cruel captivity by Atremont, the Black Knight. The herald proclaimed that whoever should conquer him would receive the hand of the Lady in marriage, together with a princely dowry. This knight was so famous for his cruelty and his victories that the young lords of the court all drew back and were unwilling to enter the list, for it was known that he was defended by enchantment, and it was his practice to hang upon a high tree all the knights whom he had defeated. Valentine, however, offered himself without hesitation, and though he did not intend to ask the lady in marriage, he nevertheless determined to attempt her rescue from the hands of the giant. Valentine, followed by Orson as his squire, soon reached the castle of the black knight and immediately demanded the freedom of the captive lady this was refused and the two knights at once began the combat the fight was long and equal at length atramont demanded a parley knight said he to valentine thou art brave and noble behold yonder hang twenty knights whom i have overcome and put to death such will be thy fate i give thee warning base traitor replied valentine I fear thee not. Come on, I defy thee. First, rejoined the black knight, fetch me yonder shield, for in pity to thy youth I tell thee, unless thou canst remove that shield, thou canst not rescue the lady nor conquer me. Valentine approached the shield, but in spite of all his efforts he could not loosen it from the tree, though it appeared to hang on only a slender branch. Valentine, breathless with his exertions to pull down the shield, stood leaning against the tree when atramont with a loud laugh exclaimed fly and save thyself fair knight for since thou canst not move the shield thou art not destined to be my victor further know there is no one living who can subdue me unless he be the son of a mighty king and yet has been suckled by a wild beast valentine started on hearing these last words and immediately ran to orson and led him to the enchanted shield on Orson's raising his arm towards it, it dropped instantly from its place. A loud blast of wind rushed through the trees, the ground rocked beneath their feet, and the black knight trembled and turned pale. Then gnashing his teeth, he seized his sword and attacked Orson with desperate fury. At the first blow, Atramont's sword broke in pieces upon the enchanted shield. Next, he caught up a battle-axe, which also snapped instantly in two. He then took a lance which was shivered to atoms in the same manner. Furious with these defeats, he threw aside his weapons, and trusting to his great strength, attempted to grasp Orson in his arms. But Orson, seizing him as if he had been a mere child, dashed him on the ground, and would have instantly destroyed him had not Valentine interposed to save his life. Orson continued to hold him down till some chains were brought, when, in despite of the furious struggles of the Black Knight, Orson bound him in strong fetters to lead him away a prisoner. Atramont, finding himself conquered, addressed himself to Valentine and said, This savage man is my conqueror, and there is some mystery in his fate. Hasten to the castle of the giant Farragus, where, if you can conquer him, you will find a brazen head kept by a dwarf that would explain to you who this savage is. You will also be able to set at liberty all the captives whom he keeps confined in his dungeons. He then directed them on their way to the giant's castle, and after they had rested and refreshed themselves, they took their departure. Chapter 4 They had to pass over many a hill and valley, and through wild and trackless forests. At last they came in view of the giant's castle, to which the entrance was by a bridge of brass. The building itself was of marble, and the battlements were surmounted by golden pinnacles, which glittered richly in the evening sun as the two brothers approached the castle. Beneath the bridge of brass a hundred bells were fastened by a strange device, so that neither man nor beast might pass over it without a loud alarm being given. The moment the two travelers began to cross the bridge, the bells sounded, and immediately the great gates of the castle were thrown open, and a huge giant stalked forth, bearing in his hand a knotted club of steel he immediately summoned them in a voice of thunder to lay down their arms yield you caitiffs said he or i will make you food for the wolves and birds of prey no one comes here and escapes with his life so long as i can wield my good club vain boaster replied valentine 
I scorn you and your threats. I come determined to force the brazen gates of your castle and to set free your prisoners. With these words he put spurs to his steed and aimed his trusty spear at the giant's head. The first thrust made the giant bleed, and he in his turn aimed a desperate blow at the knight. This happily missed and left Valentine an opportunity of attacking the giant with his sword, which he did with the greatest courage, aiming blow after blow, first on one side, then on another, with the utmost agility and skill. But at last the giant, mad with pain and rage, saw that his adversary was beginning to flag, and found opportunity to deal him a tremendous blow with his mace, which lay both horse and rider senseless on the ground. He now grinned a hideous grin, and, stooping down, he was about to aim a sucking blow, exclaiming, Now, caitiff, breathe thy last. But before he could raise his arm to strike, two tremendous blows descended upon his own head, and the monster fell groaning to the earth. These blows came from the knotty club of Orson, who, seeing his friend's danger, ran up just in time to save him. The giant was dead, and, with Orson's care and attention, Valentine soon began to recover. They now began to search the giant's castle, both to set free his captives and to find the dwarf who would give the promised explanation. As they went through the gloomy apartments and dungeons, they found the bones of many murdered knights who had been overcome by the giant, and at last, in a little dim cell lighted by one small window, they found a lady lying on the ground and bathed in tears. At their entrance she lifted up her eyes and begged for mercy. Valentine gently raised her, and assured her that they were come to succor her, that the giant was killed, and that the castle gates were thrown open. They then led her out of the dungeon into one of the apartments of the castle, and supplied her with food and wine, and attended to all her wants. They then inquired her name and her story, when she related to them her whole history as it has already been told, from the time of her marriage to the hour when the fierce giant slew her trusty attendant, and carried her off by force to the castle. But when they heard her name and that she was sister to King Pepin, they were beyond measure amazed and overjoyed, for they had often heard the sad story of the Empress of Constantinople, and how the Emperor, after she had gone, had discovered the treachery of his Prime Minister, and had made long and anxious search for his wife and children, but in vain. Chapter 5 Valentine and Orson determined to set out for the coast of France as soon as the Lady Bellissance was able to travel knowing how overjoyed the old king would be to see his long-lost sister. But, before taking their departure, they went to search for the dwarf, who at last was found in one of the turrets of the castle, and who immediately expressed his willingness to serve his deliverer, now that his cruel master was dead. They desired him to lead them to the chamber where the brazen head was kept, which he immediately did. Valentine fixed his eyes upon the head, anxious to hear what it was say concerning his birth. At length it spake thus, Thou, O renowned knight, art called Valentine the Brave, and art the man destined to be husband of the Princess Eglantine of France. Thou art son to the Emperor of Greece, and thy mother is Bellisant, sister to King Pepin of France. She was unjustly banished from her throne, and after many wanderings she was seized by a giant and confined in a dungeon of this castle, where she has been for twenty years. The wild man who hath so long accompanied thee is thy brother. You were both lost in the force of Orleans. Thou wert found and brought up under the care of King Pepin, thy uncle. But thy brother was stolen and nurtured by a bear. Proceed to France with the innocent empress, thy hapless mother. Away and prosper. These are the last words I shall utter. Fate has decreed that when Valentine and Orson enter this chamber, my power ends. Having thus spoken, the brazen head fell from his pedestal, and in the fall was broken into a thousand pieces. The two youths stood for a moment fixed with astonishment. They then joyfully embraced each other and rejoined the empress to tell her the extraordinary news they had just heard. Imagine her surprise when she saw before her her two long-lost sons. To describe her emotions on this joyful occasion would be impossible. After the first transports were over, they prepared for their departure. The stables of the giant's castle furnished them with horses, and everything else necessary for their journey was found in its well-stored recesses. So, taking with them the dwarf as their servant, the whole party proceeded towards France. The meeting of King Pepin and his dear sister was, we need not say, a happy and joyful one. 
a courier was immediately dispatched to constantinople to inform the emperor alexander of the arrival of his empress at the capital of france the messenger found him still mourning the loss of his innocent queen and refusing all comfort from those around him from the thought that by his own folly and rashness he had been the cause of her banishment and death the news was like life to the dead and the emperor as soon as he had sufficiently collected himself to give the proper orders set off with his whole court to meet his long-lost queen and to bring her back in triumph to her throne his delight was still further increased when he saw the two youths his sons and embraced them for the first time since they were children great rejoicings feasts dances and tournaments were held in honor of these events in all parts of the french king's dominions and in due time the emperor and his queen accompanied by orson took their departure for their own country valentine remained at the court of his uncle and was shortly after married to the fair princess eglantine after the death of the monarch they succeeded to the empire and were blessed with a long and prosperous reign notes valentine and orson this is one of the latest of the cycle of metrical french romances turning about charlemagne and his family it was written in prose on the reign of charles the eighth it first appeared in print at lyons in fourteen eighty nine again in fourteen ninety five it was translated into italian and published at venice in 1558 in england it was printed by copeland as the histories of the two valiant brethren valentine and orson no date again in 1637 1649 1688 and 1694 it was published in dutch in holland and even found entry into iceland it was dramatized by lope de vega in spain in germany it was printed at frankfurt am main in 1572 and at Basel in 1604. I have not thought it advisable to alter much the somewhat stilted style of this tale, which is characteristic of its origin. End of section 5. Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan. Section 6 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathaniel O'Coin A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould Little Red Riding Hood All in a little cottage there lived a little maid, the sweetest little maid that ever was seen. And her mother loves her well, but her granny loves her better, and she had a little red hood just like a little queen. Now, because this little girl wore a red cloak with a red hood, everybody called her Little Red Riding Hood. It chanced one day that her mother had made some custards and a little plum pudding, and she said, Now take the little basket and the little custard too, and the little pudding boiled for your granny dear, but don't you stop or stay, do not idle on the way. On the high road, Little Red Riding Hood will nothing have to fear. Go, said her mother straight along to your grandmother give her the nice things in your basket and then come straight home again and tell me how the old lady is mind talk to no one on the way so little red riding hood set off immediately to go to her grandmother who lived in a cottage beyond the wood instead of taking the highway she went through the wood and there she met the old grey wolf who wanted to eat her but he durst not for there were men in the wood making faggots but he stopped her and said what have you got in your basket my dear only some custard and plum pudding and a little pat of butter and where are you going my dear i'm going to see granny where does granny live my dear in the cottage beyond the wood answered red riding hood and when you get to the cottage what do you do i knock at the door and what does your grandmother say asked the wolf she says who is there answered the little girl and what do you do next i answer and say i am little red riding hood and i have brought you a custard and plum pudding and a little pat of butter what does grandmother say then inquired the wolf she says pull the bobbin and the latch will go up 
Well, when the wolf heard this, off he ran as fast as he could, taking the nearest way, and the little girl, forgetting again her mother's commands, idled on the way, picking hazelnuts, running off to butterflies, making posies of the wild flowers. The wolf was not long before he got to the old woman's door. He knocked, tap, tap. "'Who's there?' called a voice from within. "'Your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood.' replied the wolf, imitating the child's voice as nearly as possible. "'I have brought you a custard, and a little plum pudding, and a little pat of butter.' The old grandmother, who was infirm and in bed, cried out, "'Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up.' The wolf pulled the bobbin, and the door opened, and then he fell on the poor old woman, and gobbled her up in a moment, for he had eaten nothing for many days. He shut the door and jumped into the grandmother's bed and pulled on the grandmother's nightcap, which he had not eaten but had reserved lest it should spoil his appetite for what was coming. Presently he heard little Red Riding Hood's tap-tap at the door, so he called out, "'Who is there?' "'It is your grandchild, little Red Riding Hood, who has brought you a custard and a little plum pudding and a little pat of butter.' The wolf cried out to her, softening his voice as much as he could. "'Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up.' Little Red Riding Hood pulled the bobbin, and the door opened. The wolf, seeing her come in, drew the bedclothes up about his shoulders, and said, "'Put the custard, and the plum pudding, and the pat of butter on the table, and come and sit on the stool beside the bed, and tell me how your mother is.' "'She is very well, thank you, Granny.' answered the girl as she put the articles she had brought on the table. "'Mother said I was to bring back the basket,' she said, "'so that she may be able to send you something nice in it again another day.' "'That is very good of your mammy. Come and sit on the stool, my dear.' So Little Red Riding Hood came over and sat close by the bed, and she was much amazed to see how her grandmother looked. So she said, "Grandmamma." "'What great arms you have got!' "'The better to hug you, my dear.' "'Grandmamma, what a long nose you have got! "'The better to smell you, my dear.' "'Grandmamma, what long ears you have got! "'The better to hear you, my dear. "'Grandmamma, what great eyes you have got! "'The better to see you, my dear. "'Grandmamma, what great teeth you have got!' "'The better to eat you, my dear!' Saying these words, the wicked wolf threw off the bedclothes, jumped out of the bed, and fell on Little Red Riding Hood to eat her up. But at that very moment, bang! Through the door a gun was fired, and the grey old wolf rolled over, shot through the head. Then in came the forester, and this was Little Red Riding Hood's father. He had seen the wolf hasting off in the same direction in which he saw afterwards his little daughter had gone, so thought the cunning and cruel beast was after mischief, and he hastened in the same direction with his gun. Poor little Red Riding Hood was so frightened that she could not walk home, and could only sob and cling to her father, and so he carried her, and as he carried her he said, A little maid must be afraid to do other than her mother told her, of idling must be wary, of gossiping must be chary, she'll learn prudence by the time that she is older. Note, Little Red Riding Hood One of Perrault's tales, the germ of this story may perhaps be traced in the Edda. In that is told the story of Thor visiting the Thurzer, dressed in female garments, and representing himself as Freya, whom the Thurzer has asked in marriage. At the wedding banquet, Thor drinks three barrels of mead. Never did I see bride eat and drink so much, said the dismayed bridegroom. Then the Thurzer attempted to kiss his bride and raise the veil. Never did I see such fiery eyes before, he exclaimed and staggered back. Then he brought his hammer and laid it on his bride's knee, who at once struck him dead with it. Little Red Riding Hood is found in Germany, in Portugal, in Italy, etc. End of section 6 Recording by Nathaniel O'Coin Section 7 of A Book of Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lillian Elizabeth. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. The Sleeping Beauty. Many years ago, there lived a king and a queen who had an only daughter, and she was so beautiful that at her birth the king knew not what to do for joy, and he appointed a great feast to celebrate it. He invited not only his relations and friends and his whole court, but also the wise women, in order that they might be kind and bestow favors upon the new-born princess. There were thirteen of these women in his kingdom, but as he had only twelve gold trenchers for them to eat off, he could not invite them all. So one was left out. The twelve who were invited came, and when the feast was over, they began to bestow their wonderful gifts upon the child. One gave her virtue, a second beauty, a third riches, a fourth modesty, and so on with everything that is good and valuable in the whole world. But just as the eleventh had finished bestowing her gift, in came the thirteenth, who had not been invited, and began to threaten vengeance for the affront which the king had put upon her. The maiden, she said, when she comes to her fifteenth year, shall pierce her hand with a spindle, and shall fall down dead. At this the king and queen were grieved beyond measure, but the twelfth fairy, who had not yet bestowed her gift, stepped forward and spoke. She could not indeed, she said, prevent what her sister had determined, but she could mitigate it. The king's daughter, she continued, shall not die, but shall fall into a deep sleep which shall last a hundred years, at the end of which time a king's son shall awaken her. And when she falls asleep, the whole palace will sleep with her. The king, who was very anxious, if possible, to ward off this misfortune from his dear child, made a proclamation that every spindle should be sent out of the kingdom, and that none should be seen all over the land, until the princess had passed her fifteenth year. In the meantime, the wishes of the fairies came to pass, for the maiden grew up so beautiful, so modest, so amiable, and so intelligent, that no one who saw her could help immediately loving her. Now it happened one day, when she was nearly fifteen years old, that the king and queen went from home and the young princess was left quite alone in the palace. She walked about through all the rooms and passages, and wandered hither and thither as her fancy led her, till at last she came to an old tower. Here she saw a narrow staircase, which she mounted, and then she came to a little door. In the lock of the door there was a rusty key, and when she turned it round, the door sprang open, and there she saw, sitting in the corner of a little room, a very old woman, who was busily employed with her spinning wheel. "'Ah, old granny,' said the king's daughter, "'what are you about there?' "'I am spinning,' answered the old woman, and nodded her head to the princess. "'How merrily that thing goes round,' spoke the maiden taking the spindle in her hand at the same time. Let me try if I can spin too. But scarcely had she touched the spindle when she pierced her hand with it, and the enchantment took effect. That moment she fell down and sank into a deep sleep. She was then carried to a chamber and laid upon a beautiful couch, and no sooner was this done than the king and queen and their servants and the whole court and everything about the castle fell asleep likewise. The horses and grooms slept in the courtyard or in the stalls, the dogs in the kennel, the pigeons on the roof, and the flies on the walls. Even the very fire which flamed upon the hearth, 
became still and slept. The roast ceased to hiss, and the cook who had caught the kitchen girl by the hair to punish her for some fault let go her hold and fell asleep. And all that had the breath of life was still and slept. And now a hedge of thorns began to grow all round the castle, which hedge every year became higher and thicker until at last it closed in the whole building, and not even the chimney tops could be seen. And the story of the beautiful sleeping thorn rose, for thus was the princess named, was told throughout the land, so that from time to time many king's sons came and tried to force their way through the hedge into the castle. But it was all in vain, for the boughs kept together as tightly as if they had clasped each other's hands, so that the youth stuck fast among the thorns and could not get out, and after struggling and tumbling about for a long time, they one by one died. After many long years had flown by, there came another king's son through the land, and he heard by chance from an old man the story of the thorn hedge and the king's sons who had been killed by it. The old man also told him how it was said that there stood a castle on the other side of the hedge, and in the castle the beautiful princess Thornrose slept, and with her the king and queen and the whole household. Then the youth said to him, The thorn hedge shall not frighten me. I will force my way through it, for I am resolved to see the beautiful princess Thornrose, if it should cost me my life. But the day was now at hand when the hundred years were to expire, and the spell to be dissolved. And when the prince approached the hedge, the thorns appeared to his sight only large, beautiful flowers, which separated before him of themselves, and allowed him to pass through unhurt. And when he had passed, he saw them close themselves again, and stand up like a great wall behind him. He entered the castle, and looked around with him with astonishment. In the courtyard were horses with their grooms, fast asleep. The pigeons, too, sat sleeping upon the roof and hid their little heads under their wings. And when he came into the house, he saw the very flies asleep upon the walls. The cook held her hand as if she would seize the kitchen girl by the hair, and the maid sat with the black fowl before her, which she was going to pluck. He went on farther, and as he went, he saw the guards all asleep at their posts. Then he came into the great hall, and he saw all the courtiers sleeping there. He walked on again, and all was so still that he could hear his own breath. And at last he went up a winding stair, and opened the door of the chamber in which Thorn Rose slept, and not far from where she lay were the king and queen themselves. He went near to the princess, and as she lay there, all still and motionless, she looked so beautiful that he could not take his eyes off her. At last he stooped down and gave her a kiss. As soon as he had touched her cheek, Thorn Rose opened her eyes, woke up, and looked round her with a friendly smile. Then she arose, and the prince and she went down the stair together. And now the king and queen and the whole court awoke, and rubbed their eyes, and looked with wonder at each other. The horses also awoke and neighed and shook themselves. The greyhounds sprang to their feet and wagged their tails. The doves on the housetop drew their heads from under their wings, looked round, and flew away into the meadow. The flies on the wall began to creep along. The fire in the kitchen flickered and flamed up. The roast began to hiss. The old cook gave the kitchen girl a box on the ear that made her scream. The maid, too, was seen busily plucking away at the fowl. To crown the whole, the wedding of Thorn Rose and the king's son was celebrated with great feasting and rejoicings, and they lived in peace and happiness all their days. Notes The Sleeping Beauty One of Perrault's Tales This is the Don Roshan of Grimm. 
This is almost certainly a nature myth of the earth sleeping in winter till kissed by the warm rays of the spring sun, and it betokens a northern origin. The spindle is the sleep thorn wherewith, in the Norse myth, the Valkyrie Brunel was sent to sleep by Odin. In the ancient myth, the sleeping beauty was surrounded by the Waberlo, or wall of flame, till Sigurd came and released her. This myth has acquired fresh vitality from its adoption into Wagner's marvelous cycle of opera, The Ring of the Nibelungen. Perrault took the tale from the Pentamaron. End of section 7. Recording by Lillian Elizabeth. Section 8 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. The Babes in the Wood. There lived once on a time a father in Norfolk who had two little children with his wife. One was a fine and pretty boy, not passing three years old. The other a girl more young than he, and framed in beauty's mould. Now there came a pestilence in the land, and the father and mother were both taken and fell very ill, and saw that they were like to die. He was very troubled about his children, when he and his wife should be gone, this father was a man of some possessions. He sent for his brother, and he made his will, and he left to his little son three hundred pounds a year, and to his little daughter Jane he left five hundred pounds to be paid down on her marriage day. But if the children should die before they came of age, then he decreed that all the money should go to their uncle. When the father had settled his will, then he called his brother to the bedside. Now, brother, said the dying man, look to my children, dear. Be good unto my boy and girl. No friends have they here. To God and you I recommend, my children, dear, this day. But little while be sure we have within this world to stay. You must be father and mother both, and uncle all in one. God knows what will become of them when I am dead and gone. With that outspake their mother dear. O oh, brother kind, said she, you are the man must bring our babes to wealth or misery. And if you keep them carefully, then God will you reward. But if you otherwise shall deal, God will your deeds regard. With lips as cold as any stone, they kissed their children small. God bless you both, my children dear. With that their tears did fall. The brother of the dying man spoke out that he would do his best for the children and be true to the trust that was laid on him. And he said, moreover, that if he should wrong them and rob them of their rights, then he prayed that God would turn his face from him and that he might cease to prosper in his undertakings. This assurance comforted the sick father and mother, and they died and were buried in one grave. The uncle then took the children away with him to his own house, and he treated them not unkindly, yet, for all, it was not as though they had been with their own parents. It must be told how that their uncle was a covetous man, and he thought how well it would be for him if the children were to die before they grew to years of discretion, for then he would have the little boys three hundred pounds a year and the little girls five hundred pounds. He kept them in his own house for a twelve month and a day, and then he formed a wicked device to get rid of them both. There were two wicked men who lived not far off, who were ready to do any bad act if paid for it, and he sent for these men, and bargained with them to take the babes out into the green wood, and to kill them there. His wife, their aunt, was a good and kind woman, and would never have consented to such wickedness, whatever gain it might bring. 
so he told her an artful tale, that it was his purpose to send the children to a friend of his in London, who would see to their schooling. He then gave over the two children to the men with whom he had agreed, and told them that they were going to London, where were toy shops, and as many toys to be had for the asking as their hearts could desire. Away then went those pretty babes, rejoicing at that tide, rejoicing with a merry mind they would a cock-horse ride. The two men conveyed them into the wood, and as they went, the children talked to them of what they would do when they got all the pretty toys in London town. And one of the men, who was softer-hearted than the other, became sorry for what he had taken in hand to do. But the second man was hard, and he would not listen to his fellow, and said he would kill them outright. So they fell from words to blows, and they drew their swords and fought, and he who was most merciful in heart slew the other. Now, when he saw that his fellow was dead, he thought he might be taken and hanged for murder, and that he must fly. But he could no ways see what he could do with the poor babes, who stood sobbing, frightened at seeing the men fighting. He took the children by the hand, tears standing in their eye, and bade them straightway follow him, and look, they did not cry. And two long miles he led them on, while they for food complain. Stay here, said he, I'll bring you bread, when I come back again. Then he went away, and never came back. He ran from the wood and tried to escape into a distant part of the country. Now he had brought the poor babes on very near to the edge of the wood, and not a mile from where there were some cottages. And he thought that they would make their way out from under the trees and be found by kind and good people who would give them food and shelter. But the poor little children were so frightened and confused that they did not understand in which direction to go. They waited a long while for the man, and, as he did not come back, they wandered in the wood, and in place of getting out of it, by a sad mishap they turned and went back into its very depths. These pretty babes, all hand in hand, went wandering up and down, but never more could see the man approaching from the town. Their pretty lips with blackberries were all besmeared and dyed, but when came on the darksome night, they sat them down and cried. Thus wandered these poor innocents, till death did end their grief. In one another's arms they died, as wanting due relief. No burial this pretty pair of any man receives, but Robin Redbreast, piously, did cover them with leaves. It must now be told how that the wicked uncle got no rest in mind or body. Nothing prospered with him. His fields were blighted and his cattle died in stall. His barns caught fire and his substance wasted. He had sent his sons in a merchant ship to Portugal, and a violent storm arose, wrecked the vessel, and his sons were drowned. So badly did the uncle fare that in seven years all his lands and goods were in pawn or lost, and himself smitten with an ague that never left him, but made him shiver and shake. As for the man who had left the babes in the wood, he was convicted of a robbery and thrown into prison. When he confessed the whole story, how he was hired by the uncle, how he had fought with and killed his fellow, and how he had deserted the children in the wood. Thus it was the whole story came to the light of day. Note. A genuine old English tale based on a ballad. End of section 8